and ask the Lord to bless our service. swing for us at this time. Good morning. Good morning. If you would like to stand while we get this going here. We're going to be singing the same song as last week, so um, open the eyes of my heart. Of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, 
shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power in love as we sing holy 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 to see you high and lifted up shining in the light of your glory pour out your power and love as we sing holy 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 to see you high and lifted up Shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power in love as we sing holy, holy, holy. to see you holy 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 i want to see you Thank you very much. The next song we're going to do is called Never Alone. We're going to have it up there. I'm hoping that uh, some of you might remember it. We didn't have it in our hymnal, so we're putting it on the screen for you. dashing, trying to conquer my soul. I've heard the voice of my Savior telling me to do I know. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone. No, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me no, never alone, no, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. The world spins, winds are blowing, temptation sharp and keen. I feel the peace is blowing, my Savior stands between. never to leave me, never to leave me alone, oh, never alone, no, never alone, he promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone, no, never alone, no, 
really good. She says, I've never heard this song before. <laughs> she was singing it really good. She didn't have her mic all the way on, so nobody else could hear it. Oh. <laughs> I thought it was on. Awesome. <laughs> still on a learning curve, okay? It'll be okay. All right. The Paz the ushers take their places for morning tithes and offerings. I, I do have a, a, a little story to tell about. There was a, and obviously you see this stuff on the internet or whatever, but a father, daughter in a, in a restaurant, and the daughter was old enough to understand that the father was trying to figure out how, how much of a tip to leave for the waitress that got just got through taking care of her. And so she's lock, looking over her dad's shoulder, and, or you know, sitting there next to him, and said, so, so dad, it's curious to me, you're trying to figure out how to give her 15%. And why do we only give God 10%? Anyway, something to think about. <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> Brother Ken, would you ask the blessing on the offering, please? Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessings you bring into our lives. Thank you for our jobs and our homes and our income. Lord, we ask your blessing on this offering we're bringing for you today. May it be used mightily in your kingdom. Thank you, Father, for so many blessings in our life, and we're so privileged to bring back some of that to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Constant process, all right? I'm still learning. It's tough some days, but we got to do it. Learning to lean. All right. Next hymn is page 99, He Leadeth Me. I'm sorry. What? Oh, I'm sorry. My brain's 10 steps ahead as usual. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him. church? No junior church. All right. 99, he leadeth me. It is on. It was on, wasn't it? Yeah, well, All the way up. You hear it there now. <laughs>
to it, I often think about that Grace Chapel is our lighthouse, and uh, so you think about the words as we sing. There's a lighthouse on the hillside that overlooks life's sea. When I'm tossed about, it sends out a light that I, I might see. And the light that shines in the darkness now will safely lead us on. If it wasn't for the lighthouse, this ship would be no more. And I thank God for the lighthouse, I owe my life to Him. Oh, Jesus is the lighthouse, and from the rocks of sin, He has shown His light around me, that I might clearly see. If it wasn't for the lighthouse, tell me where would this ship be? Everybody that lives around us says tear that lighthouse down. The big ships don't sail this way anymore. There's no use in it standing around. But then my mind goes back to that stormy night when just in time I saw the light. Yes, the light from that old lighthouse that stands upon the hill. And I thank God for the lighthouse. I owe my life to Him. Oh, Jesus is my lighthouse, and from the rocks of sin, He has shown the light around me that I could clearly see. If it wasn't for that lighthouse, tell me, where would this ship be? And I thank God for the lighthouse. I owe my life to Him. Oh, Jesus is the lighthouse. And from the rocks of sin, He has shown the light around me that I could clearly see. If it wasn't for for that lighthouse, tell me where would this ship be? If it wasn't for that lighthouse, tell me where would this ship be? Thank you. I thank God for the lighthouse. I thank for the day. 
that one night in a prayer meeting service that the Lord spoke to me and I came to an altar of prayer. I'll never forget it. And I've been living that way of all I can, doing the best I can. Sometimes that's not all. The, I have to ask the Lord to forgive me and move on, but doing the best I can. Brother Rex, come share with us what you have. Yeah, I had a little, I got three other things I've got to say before we get to the sermon. Four, probably. Okay. Uh, Joy says to say hi. She, I will tell her you said that. You did that. <laughs> she appreciates the prayer. She appreciates the, the cards. Uh, talking to uh, uh, several times in the emails and this stuff. She just, uh, she, she just, she's just tired, and she's tired of the whole mess, and I know it's been a, a nerve-wracking thing for her, and uh, that's taken its toll, but if, if it all goes well, she went to see the urologist on Wednesday, uh, they sent a, a sample off to, to, to get a blood count, uh, she, they're making an appointment for a C-scan at the hospital, and after that she'll go back to the urologist for another exam, and they'll hopefully decide and know what's going on, so, so uh, I think and you know this, you've been through it too, that it's, it's the not knowing part of it that just wears on you over and over and over. So uh, she just wants to, to thank you for, for, for your concern. We thank you for your friendship. You guys have been a good group for us, and, and we've appreciated that. So, by the way, I remember, Ed, when 10% was a pretty generous tip. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't put it on your bill either as to what, <laughs> we, yeah. you know, so... Yeah, yeah, so anyway. Joshua chapter 1, if you uh, have turned there in your Bibles, please, and when you've turned there, I'm going to have you go back to, to, to uh, another passage we'll read first before we do that. By the way, I, I went over, I told, I told Ed, I went over Friday to uh, get keys from Ken Gray to open the home office down at Greenfield. We had a meeting down there yesterday, and... Uh, when I walked in and he was on the floor in the, in the study and he had stuff all around him and we, we sat and we visited for a while, he said, Rex, i got a question for you. Uh, now listen, I always have an answer. <laughs> it may be way off the wall, but there's an answer, you know. So he says, Rex, what's the difference between a revival and an awakening? And I said, wow, on earth. I said, I understand the revival, but what are you thinking about the, the awakening for? He says, well, he says, is there a difference? And I said, sure there is. He said, what is it? I says, an awakening is revival on steroids. <laughs> you can think about that for a while if you'd like, but revival is the idea that the, the church is revived. The people in the church are drawn closer to God. Those things that are hindering your relationship with him go. And then you start to impact the community. Uh, when awakening lasts a whole lot longer, and it doesn't affect the community, sometimes it affects the whole nation. So it's just the idea that, you know, how big, is, how big can you dream? It's the, it's the whole thing. And there's only been two or three awakenings in America in its history, but boy, they've been, they've been big things that have saved and helped America in the process. You got Joshua? You got it marked? Go back to Deut go back to the. Exodus chapter 33. We want to talk about Joshua being the new leader for the people, God's chosen servant to lead the people into the promised land. And this is kind of the background for it. Verse 7 of chapter 33. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrance of their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Now, wouldn't that, be, wouldn't that be an experience? Have you ever, I, just to hear the voice? I, I don't know. Most people trembled. Most people were afraid. But anyway, 
Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they all stood and worshipped each at the entrance to his tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. That's our introduction to Joshua. Okay? His aide. So Joshua was the person who was with Moses all the time, his right-hand man, if you will. Now we go back to Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 to 9. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses ate, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to thee, or to them, and to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert of Lebanon, from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. But be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. The passage in Exodus got me working on a project some time ago because it speaks about Joshua being young and we always think about Joshua being young when he took when he was to take over the leadership after Moses but you start doing the math and it doesn't work out quite that way and let me go well I just want to go through that with you number one most scholars that they have the nerve to write and so you can read it and use their stuff right said that Joshua was probably between 45 and 55 years old at the Exodus. I just round that off to 50. It's easier to do the math, okay? They wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Okay, so how old is Joshua now? He's 90 years old. So this command from God to be strong and courageous had nothing to do with being young. That's my So what did it have to do with? What was it about Joshua that God repeated three times, four actually, if you go back to Deuteronomy, be strong and courageous? Now the Bible don't tell us, but I have my thoughts. I want to share them this morning as the foundation for this. And I'll start out by asking a question. If you were to follow a leader like Moses... How would you feel? Moses was a mighty man, period. I think Joshua felt inadequate to follow the footsteps of Moses. I think Joshua felt inadequate to do what God was asking him to do. There's a lot of difference between being number two and number one, right? Right? And now Joshua is number one. And I think there were some real questions in Joshua's mind and in his heart about this idea of leading the children of Israel into the promised land. He had had 40 years of being with those folks, and they, he knew how they acted. He knew, he knew it didn't take much to get them stirred up. Okay? So I don't think it had to do... In, from, from Joshua, from the standpoint of, of being young, I think Joshua felt that he couldn't do what God was asking him to do. God, I just can't, I just can't do that. I, can't, I, I just can't. 
I can't be a Moses. My shoes won't fit in his tracks. And God speaks to him in these verses, and I want to just share that with you. Uh, by the way, let's go on with John. He's 90 years old. They cross over the, the, the Jordan River. They go in. They start into the Promised Land. There's a seven-year military uh, uh, campaign where the Israelites capture the Promised Land. They go across the middle first. They divide it. Then they go south, and then they go north. It takes seven years to do that. After that, then they have to divide up the land between the nine and a half tribes that are left. And I put down three years for that. Now, you know why? I've served on a lot of boards and committees, and it takes sometimes seven years to get anything done. Okay? It, 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 it does. In, in fact, I'll, I'll use this as an example. Uh, it seems to me, as I hear right, that Ohio's having trouble dividing the, the, the state up into districts, and aren't they? No. I'll use this as an example. In our Christian Union directory, general counsel part of it, there was an education requirement to be ordained. It was put into effect in the 50s. It hadn't been used since the 70s. No state, in, as Christian Union churches, in no state used the educational requirements. 2013, I made a motion at general counsel that we strike that out of the general counsel bylaws because it wasn't being used. You know how long it took to get that done? 2019. It took them six years to get something out of the directory that they would, no one was using for 40 years. So I, I can understand Joshua from the standpoint, I've got 500,000 men, and we've got all this land, and I've got to divide this land up between 500,000 men and their families, and you want me to get this done in, in, a, in a week, God? So I give him three years for that, okay? And <clears throat> that makes him right at 100 years old. And then he gets to retire. And he goes to the land that God has set aside for him. And then he dies at 110 years of age. So he got 10 years to enjoy what the, 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 really the promises that God had given to him. God made four commitments to Joshua in this passage of Scripture that I want us to consider this morning. Number one, <clears throat> God's personal commitment to Joshua. He says it three different, two different times. You are the one. I think that this generation is calling it, you the man? Something like, is that close? You the man? <laughs> You're as close as I can come to ask. <laughs> The rest of us, Joshua, you are the man. I have chosen you, okay? The second thing comes is the fact, God's commitment of his presence with Joshua. I will be with you. A promise. And he makes that to, to Joshua three different times. Joshua, not only are you the man, but I'm going to be with you. And you're going to sense my presence with you. From now on as the leader of this nation. Number three, God's promise to the Israel's forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, that <clears throat> they were going to possess the land. God made a promise 500 years before that, and now it's going to be fulfilled. Okay. And the last one is <clears throat> God's promise of prosperity and success if they obey his revealed word. Did you catch that in there? If, if you do what, what, in other words, okay, they only had five books they had to know, memorize and live by. And that's the first five books of the Bible. The books that, that probably Joshua had written at, as Moses would have quoted it to him. And God says, listen, Joshua, if you and this group of people that you're, you're led into the promised land will obey my word as I gave it to Moses, then this will always be your promised land. And it will be a land of, 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 of prosperity. Those are the four promises that he made to them.
Now let, let's, let's make some application from this if we can. Okay, what are we supposed to do with this? Number one, age should not be a major barrier in serving God. I have, I've got that word age or, or, or major in parentheses or in quotes. Because, uh, come on, age does make a difference. I'll be 76 pretty soon. And I've noticed the progress in this whole thing going boom with the memory. See, I, I, I used to not have a problem. I could remember things. And then it got to the place where I, well, I was going into the study to get three things, and I got two of them, and I didn't get the third one. So I would go back to where I started with to try to remember what the third one was. You with me? Somebody? <laughs> well, see, I'm beyond that now because I... I <laughs> I got three things I'm supposed to get, and I could go back there three times, and I still wouldn't remember what two of them was that I was supposed to there for. I mean, it, it get, it's pretty embarrassing when you go someplace and you don't remember what you went there for. Okay? So, listen, I think, I think God understands this, but age is a barrier, but it's not a major barrier. If Moses could take over this assignment when he was 80, and Joshua could take it over when he was 90... Then, then, okay, there's still something that we can do for God's kingdom and for our Lord and Savior. That's the point of that. Number two, God's promises are fulfilled in God's timing. Have you ever been told that you're an impatient person? <laughs> Yeah, for you, we were supposed to be done five minutes ago, right? I <laughs> if you're an impatient person, then God's going to work on you. I can just guarantee you it's, it's going to work. It, 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 it's been 500 years since God made the promise to Abraham before the children of Israel walked on the promise of land, the promised land, the ground, okay? It's been 40 years since they left Egypt. Sometimes God works very slowly in the process of, of working with our patience, or rather I should say our impatience. Back home there was a, a, a lady. I, never, I didn't know her when we were in school. I knew her kids, <clears throat> and I didn't know her husband. And uh, later on, uh, I got the opportunity to, to, to preach a few times at their church, and one of the times she, she just shared that she had prayed for her husband to be saved for 40 years. 40 years every day she prayed that God would save her husband. When she shared that, her husband was beside her in the pew. Okay? Change man. He was one of the trustees in the church and he was involved in things and just... She didn't tell the whole group, but she said something to me afterwards. She says, you know, he's a totally different man than the man I married. She patiently, every day, prayed for 40 years. So sometimes God's promises are not fulfilled when we want it. I'll say, the military fit me pretty well. Because I, I kind of I liked, liked, liked the regiment, the whole idea of that. And we, when we did something, we did it now. I mean, you didn't, you, you didn't plan it for three years before you... you, you, you and I, I kind of related to that. And uh, I got home and got out of the service and went to work. And, and uh, God worked on me a little bit. He, he, he gave me 20 ladies underneath me in quality control to work for me. Most of them were old enough to be my mom. I thought, God, how on earth? What did I do to deserve this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, it's a, it's, it's a lot different than, than what it used to be. Uh, at, at, at Zion, our home church, they called me a converted perfectionist. <laughs> you know where that's going, right? 
Listen, we got to be, you, you got to be patient. Job is our, our Sunday school lesson. Sometimes we don't understand why. And sometimes God doesn't answer us right away either. And in the time of, of, of instant everything, God doesn't always work that way. And we have to remember that. Number three, obedience to God's word is not an option. I listened to a man on the radio on the mail route uh, one time. He spoke on radio Bible class. And he said, <clears throat> there is no selective obedience with God. You don't get to pick and choose what you will obey and what you won't obey. It comes as a package deal, is what I'm saying, okay? <clears throat> and number four, God doesn't do everything for us normally. He expects us to do our part. Let me say it another way. Rarely does God do the supernatural when the natural works. When he can use us to do what he wants done, then he won't use the supernatural. That's the purpose and that's the reason why we're here. And while we're here, we're to serve him. As Christians, we're to serve him and be obedient to him and do what he's asking us to do. I told you, I, I, I confess that I'm not a very patient person, so it, it, it kind of works that way. You know, uh, and I've learned my lessons, a lot of them, the hard way. And sometimes we get into a situation, I've been there, where God leads you so far, and then all of a sudden there's no leading. And so you're asking God, what's going on? And you're expecting an answer by supper time. And a week goes by. A month goes by. A year goes by. Sometimes three or four years go by and there's still no answer. You're convinced you're where God wants you to be, doing what God wants you to do, but for some reason, he's not using you the way you think he ought to be used. The Christian life is a faith walk from beginning to the end. Okay? Eyes on Jesus following his directions, doing what he has us to do. Let me just share this in closing. This would have been early on. I was going to Fort Wayne Bible College, working on my bachelor's degree, and, and I was pa pastoring at the Olive Branch Church. I was driving 75 miles back and forth each way and doing all the things at the, at the church and stuff. And, and <clears throat> some of the people at the church didn't feel I ought to be going to Bible college. And the one couple in particular were, was, was most outspoken about it. Now, they had six chil children. Four of them were all college grads. Two of them were nurses. One was a, an accountant. You know, the other two later went to college, got their degrees, but Rex did, the pastor didn't deserve a degree. Now, that's the bad attitude of Rex, okay? Dr. Wes Gehrig was a professor at Fort Wayne Bible College. He did... Greek, Hebrew, he did systematic theology and some historical books. And he had a policy that every semester he would post on his door of his, his, his office a schedule when he would be open and available for, for, to talk. And I'd, I'd went in and talked to him a couple of times, and I was pretty frustrated about what was going on within, within the church. And I went to Dr. West, and, and, and I said, Dr. West, can, can I ask you something? And we, we got the discussion about it. I said, what was going on? I said, you know, I'm, I'm ready to quit. I'm ready to resign and leave. Uh, and he says, well, <clears throat> he said, let's review this. Let's go through this. He says, do you think God taught you, or God, God led you to go to Bible college? And I said, yes, I did. He said, so that's your first and foremost commitment that you made at this time. I, I, I said, that's right. He said, then pastoring the church is second to that. Now, that don't go down easy. Okay? It don't. So... But I said, yeah. He says, then, Rex, if it ever comes to the point where the church is blocking you from fulfilling your first thing that you committed to God, then you leave the church. 
And I, we prayed, and I walked out, and I, they didn't get quite to the door. And he says, oh, Rex? And I said, yeah. He says, if ever comes a time the Christian Union don't want you, he says, I've got some missionary churches that will take you with no problem. <laughs> the lesson I got out of that was there was a man that had my back. I could rely on him. I could depend on him. And sometimes we get into those situations. We go to God. We go to Jesus. But it doesn't hurt at all to have someone that you know has your back and is there fighting for you. Joshua. New assignment, something he didn't want to do. And God says, I've got your back. I've got your back. Let's pray. Father, thank you, first of all, for the stories and the people that we have in the Bible and, and how you dealt with them and, and what happened in their lives because of your blessings. And we have this to encourage you, but more than that, we have your presence and we know you have our back. So Lord, just strengthen our faith in, in, in what we're doing. Lord, Prepare the hearts of the people for the revival that's coming. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Have you stand and get your hymnals. Turn to page 368. 368. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. Sweeter